Yo, what's up guys? Welcome back to another video. This is a reaction to Johnny Harris and this is um, continuing the series of how Europe stole the world. And this is how Europe stole Africa, so quickly. <coughs> and yeah, I was I reacted to the past, the other two, like I guess a month ago now. And I said when the next one comes out, I was going to react to it. And it came out 19 hours ago. And yeah, I'm here reacting to it now. But yeah, we're going to jump into this, hopefully going to enjoy. And yeah, links are in the description to my Patreon if you want to see some more videos of mine. Some movie reactions series reactions all that good stuff you can suggest me things to watch on the patreon and yeah links are there in the description if you want to see that but i'm so stuffy right now um yeah we're going to jump into this and see or learn about this whole thing we know i know a lot because obviously england france germany and spain are, are the main countries and portugal are the main countries i can think about that done a lot in africa a lot of colonizing so yeah we're going to see more though and learn about the whole history i guess <laughs> we need to look at something astounding that happened over the course of like a hundred years. This is the final chapter and what I think is the most mind-boggling chapter in the story of how Europe took over the world. The reason why it's so mind-boggling is because this is the part of the story where the map goes from looking like this in 1800, with Europe controlling like 35% of the world's land, to looking like this by 1914. Jeez. With 84% of the earth being controlled by the people or the descendants of the people from this once isolated continent, Europe. 84%. How on earth did this happen? A huge part of this next chapter has to do with this continent. The second largest continent on earth and the part of the world that the Europeans hadn't really carved up yet. So this is where the whole story comes together and shows us how technology and different ways of thinking helped these people take over the world and in the process, shaped the world we live in today. The way that we trade, where we get our stuff, the language I'm using to speak to you right now and most of you understand it even though you don't live anywhere near the place where it was invented. I'm telling you, this isn't far away history anymore. This is the world we currently live in. So let me show you the third and final chapter I mean, what? He's, it was 1804 to like 1914. In terms of actual like, history of the world, that's not long ago at all. That's like recent history. So yeah, this is like really, and I'm, I'm kind of surprised all that happened in that sort of time frame. I didn't realize it was that recent. I thought it would be a bit further, a, like longer, a, lo a much longer time than that, but obviously not, which is crazy. Of how Europe stole the world. <laughs> just over a hundred years ago. Another video, another set of beautiful printed maps. And I'm telling you, this is the chapter where the maps get really good. Cartography really took off. Okay, let's get up to speed on where we're at. Remember, it all started with Spain and Portugal. They ramped up this colonialism thing back around 1500. And this led them to divide the world between them until other European countries got in on it too. Then the real competition started. The Dutch created the modern corporation, which allowed them to speed all of this up. The world quickly turned into a giant marketplace, run by Europeans with boats and guns and incentives to bring profits to the shareholders back home. This is all a huge part of the story, but I'm telling you, when it comes to scale, imperialism is just getting started. And that's because Europeans are about to level up. We're gonna call this imperialism 2.0, a new way of taking over the world, fueled mostly by technology and a rare cooperation between all of these empires. One British prime minister described this imperialism 2.0 as quote, the vulgar and bastard imperialism of irritation and aggression, of grabbing everything, even if we had no use for it. Fucking but up. let me tell you, if you're like me and you kind of have a low-key implicit belief that European domination was inevitable and that this was going to happen no matter what, I'm here to tell you that it almost didn't happen. That's because by the end of the 1700s, revolution was in the air. Empires were losing their colonies. 
starting with a group of Europeans who were done having a king and declaring independence for themselves in the late 1700s. Soon you had a bunch of Spanish colonies declaring independence. And then over here in Haiti, you had enslaved people who were organizing and rebelling against their French masters, throwing them out and starting their own country. These empires weren't only losing their colonies. Back in Europe, one ruler even lost his head in all of this. The empires were losing their grip and soon oh, they yeah, were fighting with one another like never before. It was chaos. And it totally freaked these European rulers out. Are they losing their empire? Are they gonna lose their reins on power? Is the era of abundance and domination coming to an end? No, we can't let this happen. So they start doing something that was kind of unheard of. Instead of fighting and competing with each other, like they've always done, the European powers start talking to each other. Their empires were in jeopardy and they needed to collaborate, find ways to share power both at home in Europe, but also on the world stage. Soon this new culture of diplomacy and collaboration would turn to focus on the one continent that none of these European powers had carved up yet, the new imperial frontier. Certainly full of resources, but not yet conquered. I mean, the maps tell the story here. Was that the map of Africa at the time? Jeez, look at how they've made the map. It's so different to how... Actually, it, it, no, it does look, look like this. It's just the scale is a lot more different. I mean, the maps tell the story here. The maps were like a record of what Europeans knew and didn't know about the world. I mean, this one British map from 1800s says it all. Look at this thing. Europeans were definitely familiar with Africa, especially here in the coast, where for hundreds of years they had trading posts and of course the Atlantic slave trade. But look how they map the interior of the continent. It literally just gives up and is like inland parts almost entirely unknown, which is pretty rare for this time period. At this point, the Europeans had really mapped a lot of the world, but this place was off limits. It was the stuff of legend, of myths. The caption here on the map says that this interior part of Africa may be considered as absolutely unknown or completely unexplored. All we know, says the map, is that its immense and arid sands are intersected with complete collections of the most ferocious beasts and most uncivilized men. That's all they know. There was a very good reason for this. The fact is that soldiers and explorers from Europe who went into this area, a lot of them didn't come home. Up to 40% died from diseases really? like the mosquito-borne illness malaria. So much so that this part of the map became known as the white man's grave. Totally off limits. But that what? soon changed. Two giant things happen that change everything, completely redirect what Europeans can do with their mounting power. First, these two French guys are able to take the bark of this tree, which had been used for a very long time for a variety of purposes, and isolate a vital chemical called quinine. It combats malaria, the major killer of Europeans in Africa. They now have a white man's shield to protect them from the white man's grave. The door is slowly creaking open. But they just, they made that in this time frame. What the hell? Second, this guy happens. King Leopold II. He's the king of this new country called Belgium, and it existed for like 40 years. It's kind of a minor place in Europe, nothing like these OG colonizers. So it's like 1875, and King Leopold wants to play with the big boys. He wants a colony. Did they take over, like, I say take over, colonize like Congo? I know there's a few countries actually that Belgium did. And there's some crazy stuff that Belgium done, isn't there? Some awful things. So he literally goes around and starts asking these major colonial powers for like some of their land. Like he goes to the OGs, Spain and Portugal. And he's like, hey guys, I know you're in decline. Can I have one of your colonies? And they're like, no. So then he goes to the British and he's like, hey guys, I know you have New Guinea. Maybe you don't have any plans for it. You could give it to me. And they're like, no, Leo, don't you realize how hard we worked to steal this land? We're not just gonna give it to you as a handout. So King Leopold decides to take matters into his own hands. He turns to the map and decides this part of the map, the parts unknown, where none of the colonizers have arrived to yet, is a prime place for his colony. Wow. King Leopold sets his sight on the white man's grave. A Little quick old Belgium. That this is kind of the fantasy of the Europeans who haven't explored this. In reality, at this point, Africa looks a lot more like this. But in the mind of King Leopold and other Europeans, it's a big blank canvas with unlimited possibilities. 
So Leopold sends explorers to like the dead center of this blank canvas. And they're armed not only with some of the latest and greatest weapons, but also with medicine that shields them from these killer tropical diseases. These Belgian explorers arrive and are able to make agreements with the locals, laying claim to this land. King Leopold now has his own little colony in the center of the white man's grave. And of course, they start mapping it. This is a map from a bunch of Belgian cartographers and explorers when they first arrive to this center part of Africa. Very little detail here at the beginning. This is 1880. They basically got this river, some of the offshoots, but they don't really know what's going on in here yet. This becomes the frame that Leopold uses to build his colony. Now, of course, this freaks the French out because they're like, hey, what's Belgium doing in Africa? Why are they exploring all this land? So they decide to send their own explorers to claim their own bit of land. After all, they've got the medicine. It's not nearly as dangerous. And the Belgians are doing it. Well, of course, now the British are waking up. They're sending people oh, too. Wow. And even the new kid on the imperial block, Germany is chipping in. And now suddenly, we've got a scramble on our hands. So was there, wait, was there wars between these countries, these European countries, over getting these bits of land? But wait, say the European powers, let's learn from our mistakes. Instead of the old days where we always had to fight over things, in this era of revolution and warfare, remember that we're trying to be better about talking to one another, okay. coordinating, remember? So it's 1884, and all these big Africa-hungry European empires get together in Berlin. I mean, this is amazing painting. 1884 this happened, like, this is what? 30 years before World War One, I? I mean, it's a long time ago, and like, in like, for me, but in like human history, that's not even that far ago. Like, what the hell? Just them all sitting here looking at this big, beautiful map, which would be like an amazing activity <gasps> to do until you realize what's actually happening here. You've got the Chancellor of Germany, you've got the OG colonizers, Portugal, explaining this place to Belgium and France and Italy, and you've even got the new country, the United States, who showed up. Kind of new to all this imperial stuff, but quickly learning how power really works on the international stage. Basically, anyone in Europe who didn't have an empire yet got in now. Oh, and crucially, they didn't invite any African leaders. And to be clear, this painting isn't like exaggerated, like it's not a political cartoon. This is literally a bunch of European dudes in a room in Berlin in 1884, discussing and coordinating how they're going to carve up and take this continent. And they decided what that the there was hell? gonna be one big rule for this new scramble for Africa. No pretending. None of this only on the map fake imperialism thing that the Pope arranged for Spain and Portugal a few hundred years previous. You actually have to control the land if you're gonna claim it. So they divide up the map on who gets what, they leave the conference, and they get to work. The French start moving in quickly from West Africa. The British begin taking over Sudan and expanding north from down here in South Africa to take over all of this land. The Germans really start establishing themselves here and over here. Italy starts occupying all this land up here in the north and east. And Leopold, well, he got his colony. 77 times the size of Belgium. Here it was as a blank canvas when they first started exploring in 1880. Here it is 14 years later. Little Belgium down here, giant Congo up here. That is crazy. The blueprint has filled out. The conquest is complete. With his new colony, King Leopold, of course, went on to do horrible things, exploiting, pillaging the resources from this place and wreaking horrible havoc on the people. And it is horrific and it is horrendous. And I made a whole other video that kind of goes into it more. I'll link to it and go to the sources in the description, please. Okay. All of these empires were carving up this map, coming in, mapping it very beautifully. It's like literally the opposite of what it was. It was unknown and now it's totally known. Pillaging the resources, bringing it back home, making record profits, et cetera, et cetera. And all of this, this carving, it happened really fast. But wait a minute, hold on, pause. How does this make any sense? Like it made sense when it was all like on water and there were ships and there was domination and trading ports and all of that. But this, this is an incredibly logistically ambitious thing to do. Like this was actually a central question for me that led me to make this series because I just didn't understand how these countries in a matter of a few years could completely carve up the second largest continent. Well, the answer to that question isn't that surprising. These Europeans now had a leg up, they had new tools. 
Remember they had invented capitalism to make them rich. That gave them time to do science, which gave them technology that they used to make their capitalism better and more effective, more productive. This cycle repeated itself over and over and over, giving Europeans a further and further leg up technologically. Until soon, they had stuff like this, a steamboat. You didn't have to worry about the wind anymore to keep going. You could just steam your way all the way up African rivers. On the old African queen. Or the railroad, a quick way to transport food and troops. Like you can see this map, all of this red is either railroads that they put in or railroads that they were constructing at this time. They built all these railroads, what? In such a short time frame, that is insane. Time. This allowed Europeans to level up not just in Africa, but everywhere. I mean, here they are in India. The British quickly taking over this entire subcontinent of what today is India and Pakistan and Bangladesh with this massive complex rail system that they built basically in no time. They also what? invented the telegraph, which could now relay messages in a matter of minutes instead of weeks. I mean, this political cartoon really personifies how powerful <laughs> this was. And of course, what we've been looking at this whole time they made maps. Big, beautiful, juicy maps showing the geography and the people and all of the land that they had conquered. In addition to technology, these empires had also perfected the art of allying with local power holders and turning the people against each other, divide and conquer, which allowed a small group of Europeans to control millions of locals. And of course, they had these. These refined killing machines that allowed small groups of European soldiers to rip through truly formidable African armies. Like look at this painting from Sudan, where the British used their guns to slaughter 10,000 enemies with just a few hundred losses. And here this casual caption uh. showing that these savages were now mowed down by these modern weapons of war, clearing way for civilization. Now, it wasn't this easy everywhere. Descendants of white Dutch settlers held off the British for a long time down here in South Africa. And the Ethiopians were able to hold off the Italians from conquering their land, making it the only place in Africa to never be colonized. Wow, really? But listen, in the midst of all this bloodshed, we have to talk about something that doesn't fit cleanly into our narrative of good versus evil. Because the presence of these Europeans in this continent also brought really positive things. Remember those French dudes that discovered the treatment for malaria? Well, that was tested in the field in French Algeria, a colony. It changed medicine forever, giving us our modern understanding of mosquitoes and the diseases they spread. This scramble into Africa helped push forward our understanding of health and disease and medicine. These and and tons of other medical developments helped these Europeans conquer land, but it also brought innovation that we still use today that has saved countless lives. Okay, so technology was a major defining factor, but it wasn't just technology. Once again, we see in this chapter what we saw in other chapters, that Europeans had to develop new sophisticated mental inventions that allowed this all to go down. The popular story that they were telling themselves at this time was that all civilization could be ranked according to the level of development. And look, according to this analysis, they placed themselves at the top. F of course. Oh my god, <clears throat> it makes me cringe just seeing how their sort of mindset was back in these days. And they could tell themselves very easily that they were the enlightened people of the world. This new colonizing story was the most sophisticated and tantalizing yet, and it's one that's still kind of embedded in a lot of our brains still. That the enlightened civilization had a burden to bring civilization to the rest of the world. And for that, they kind of needed to stay on top and control. And the reason why this story was so believable and tantalizing is because at this time, it was being blended with actual real objective science that was being done by Europeans, like this guy, Charles Darwin, someone who changed the way that we think about the natural world. He had just put out a book about how animals evolve into hierarchies with different capabilities and traits. Well, if that applies to all animals, then it must apply to humans themselves and their societies and their civilizations. So then they go out into the field with their maps and they start gathering observations that confirm this story. And soon they're measuring people's skulls all around the world. They're keeping notes, they're developing theories and terms, they're writing academic papers, all of this to define a pretend set of pseudoscientific ideas. The idea that we're all part of a different race, all with different natural capabilities. And that is what must explain why some people have the resources and the technology and others do not. 
Like the previous stories that Europeans told themselves, this one was intoxicating. Think of all the generations that passed where this story could be ingrained into the minds of the people. But again, remember that like, I'm not saying that these Europeans are telling themselves this story every day. We're now talking about the great, great, great grandchildren of like the original colonizers. The individual people didn't have the grand plan in mind to go carve up Africa. They were just responding to what they knew, what they'd been told was real, what they wanted to believe. It was a way of life. It was a way of thinking. And if we think that we're somehow exempt from a similar type of mental model that we don't see, but that dictates our behavior, we're tricking ourselves. I mean, listen to one of these British imperialists, Cecil Rhodes. He says, we happen to be the best people in the world with the highest ideals of decency and justice. When you've, when you've flipping colonized all these places, killing thousands of people, what, where, where's that? Where's the correlation with that and being the best people in the world? Liberty and peace. And the more of the world we inhabit, the better it is for humanity. Okay. Cecil has made up his mind. What the fuck? When was he around? Surely he... Was he around in this sort of era as well? Like, he's sort of sounding a bit like Hitler at this point. Like, Hitler and his, like, love for blonde people and blue eyes. What what, what, what region is it again? Or what? The Aryan race. I mean, it's not the same thing, but it's it's a similar thing to that. And it's just like, bro, what the fuck? Why was Hitler so looked looked down upon, which he should have been? But then these people... and I mean, they are looked down upon now, but at the time... Like, it's just... It's just crazy to me. Okay, so let's look at the map in like the early 1900s. Africa looks like this, completely carved up by European powers. Over here, the Dutch had conquered the entire Indonesian archipelago, the French mm -hmm. completely taking over this part of Southeast Asia. But the real kingpin in all of this taking over land stuff was the British Empire. In addition to all this stuff they had in Africa, they occupied the huge Indian subcontinent. They also had a few of these important ports like Hong Kong and Singapore. I mean, I can't go over <laughs> all of the stuff they took over because it's just too too much. At the peak of their empire, they ruled over 412 million people, which was a ton for that time. Their domination had spread to almost 25% of the globe, making Britain, this rainy set of islands in Europe, the biggest empire that ever existed. In doing so, they spread their people, their ideas, their economic system, their fringe language to every corner of the world including where I'm sitting right now, because remember the US is just one expression of the British Empire. It's a branch of the empire that went on to become the most powerful country in the world, to influence how the world order would look. By 1914, Europe had successfully taken over the world. Damn, look at that, man. Wait, so, um, this one here, oh, that's just for Russia. Yeah, this is crazy, man. They were deathly rich compared to the rest of the globe. And their ideas, both good and bad, were deeply embedded in the international system. But suddenly, all of this technology, all this industrialization that made them so effective, turned away from conquering faraway lands and was turned on each other. Over the next 30 years, hundreds of millions of people are killed in the two most destructive wars ever made possible by all the same things that allowed Europeans to take over the world. Sophisticated weapons and technology that Europeans are now- Europe is just a mess, isn't it? The history of Europe is nuts. Especially the more recent history, because like the history of the world, like, different regions have had their times on top at a certain point. But in terms of recent history, Europe has done some wild ass stuff. They like trying to take over the whole world and they just fight each other, all this stuff, like they just can't have some peace for a couple couple minutes or it was like that before i mean it's still like that now to be fair now but... turning on each other the so-called sophisticated race is now slaughtering one another on an unprecedented scale mm. these wars didn't do the image of the civilized europeans any good and western schooled local elites decided that they didn't want to be ruled by foreign forces anymore they were able to rally their people around a common language and birthed national identity that didn't include being ruled by white people from some faraway continent. And they pushed the colonists out, sometimes peacefully, but most often with force. The Europeans had built this insane global project for more than 400 years, and yet they saw it crumble in a matter of decades. So today, the map has been severely redrawn. Former colonies are now mostly independent countries. There are still a ton of weird idiosyncratic holdovers from the colonial period. I've talked about those many times and I will continue to talk about them. 
I want to finish this up, finish this video and finish this series up with my last thought here, which is something that the map doesn't tell us much about. Even though all these countries became independent and they can claim their own sovereignty, their own borders, their colonizers are gone, they didn't actually. Not only were there loads of borders that were literally drawn by colonizers, I mean, see basically all of my previous work. But by the end of this, it was the Europeans that had tied the whole world up into an interconnected system that still kind of echoed the old one. The Dutch invention of the shareholder corporation didn't go away. Private companies didn't suddenly stop looking to the same far off places to find resources, to find yep. labor, to feed increasing mm -hmm. demand among their people back home. And European rulers and their offspring didn't stop using their big metal guns and their technology to get what they wanted in faraway lands. Occasionally talking to each other and occasionally fighting with each other. Fighting to control land, to control people, to control ideas. And perhaps most powerfully, the idea that our enlightened way was indeed the best way. We will stand with the new leaders of Iraq as they establish a government of, by, and for the Iraqi people. It certainly has not gone away. And yet, if it were only that simple, a simple narrative of good and bad, greedy Europeans take over the world and do anything to stay ahead. That would be a lot easier in some ways, but it's not. Europe taking over the world has also thrust humanity into an age of peace and prosperity, where people live longer, suffer less in a lot of ways, have more food to eat. I mean, the very moral lens that you and I are using right now to evaluate the good and bad of this history, that was a lens that was cultivated and developed by the same cultures that pillaged and subjugated their way around the planet. These ideals of justice and equality and human rights and representation, social equality and self-determination, those ideas permeated the globe alongside the colonizers who carved it up. And yet it was this conquest that put these people on top of the whole system, giving us the power and the advantage, the default power holders in our world. These three parts have been a story of how an isolated group of farming people, some of them my ancestors, left their shores to explore, discovering a vast world that eventually they would find a way to control, and in the process, setting the rules for how things work today. What's slightly scary to me about this is how easy it is to look back on this whole history and feel like it was gonna happen this way no matter what that it was inevitable, that of course Europeans took over the world. They were always more adept, they were bound to control the planet. But if there's anything I've learned diving into this broad tour through European imperialism, is that this idea is just hindsight bias. This didn't happen because of some superior DNA or because God wanted these people to take over the world, but rather it happened because a bunch of people happened to be at the right place that allowed them to start a chain of millions of little decisions that pushed them to do whatever they could to procure more and more more resources. They got ahead because of lucky circumstances, and yet today in our modern world, we continue to do whatever we need to to stay ahead, while simultaneously believing that it was always going to happen this way. <laughs> This is an ad. Really started to ramp up, and that gets me to the thing that I'm. It's an ad and stuff. Shout out to him getting his money, all that good stuff. But um, always talk about recording. No, it is an ad. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. I mean, if you're interested in that, links are in the description. But damn, this series was interesting, and I learned a lot. Like you learn about things here and there in school, but obviously there's a lot of stuff left out, and I feel like I definitely learned a lot more here. Like, obviously, uh, positives, there's always positives that come from war, because, like, technology advances, medicine advances, all these things advance, but then, and, like, it, there's good points that he made at the end as well, because it's true, like, a lot of the morals of the world came from all the bad stuff that we done, and, like, just many things like that, but it's just crazy, man, all the horrible things that went on in this time frame, and it's, again, it's much more recent than I realised. As a Congolese, it will always anger me the horrendous acts that Leopold II projected in Congo because the consequences of his actions have... Yeah, there's a lot of... There's, like, war between Congo and the Democratic Congo, right? I think. Um, and, what well, I guess it is still because of what he done then. A lot of the things that the European 
colonizers did will still be in place like a lot of the anger between i guess tribes or people and stuff caused by the europeans that's kind of sad when you think about it well it is really sad but yeah this was a interesting watch and if you want some more johnny harris let me know in the comments and until next time like subscribe peace